It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sheila Robertson, one of my favorite speakers. Um, there's so much I could say about her, but I want to give her the opportunity to uh, address the topic at, at hand, uh, navigating anesthetic drug shortages after COVID-19. Dr. Robertson is an anesthesia and pain management specialist, and uh, we are very fortunate to have her with us today. Thank you, Sarah. So I'm really excited to have been invited by Maddie's to do this presentation for you. And I just want to mention that I did my um, shelter medicine certificate through University of Florida Maddie's um, program. And that was back in 2014. So I do have a lot of interaction and experience with Maddie's and how, what a wonderful job they do. And my main job in life up until now has been as an anesthesiologist, but that included a lot of pediatric and high volume, high quality spay and neuter clinics and also a community cat clinic. And then I also did a lot of anesthesia in referral hospitals. So quite a mix of background, but we're gonna focus on one specific area that is hurting everybody right now no matter what type of work you're doing. If it involves anesthesia, we're certainly navigating some drug um, shortages. So that's why it's very appropriate, I think, right now to talk about what are the current drug shortages, why they've happened, um, what it's gonna look like in the future, because it's pretty uncharted territory. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the demand and supply for specific drugs and why that affects us as veterinarians. And that is because we are using a lot of drugs that human doctors use. There's a global supply chain issue um, with a lot of the ingredients for the drugs that we want. I'm gonna talk about which drugs are likely to be already affected or will be affected. And obviously the main thing is I'm gonna give you solutions if you run into a problem with your favorite drug being unavailable. So right off the bat, we're gonna put up a poll question just to see how everybody is weathering the storm at the moment. And so we're gonna put up this poll question and I'm gonna read it out, but those of you that are already logged in can start answering the question. So I'm asking you, are you currently experiencing and you can select all that apply. And the issues that you may be experiencing are, and this is any drug that you use in your patients, drug back orders, a specific drug not being available at all, or that you're being put on allocation, which means that the, uh, your normal supplier is only giving you limited stock, or none of you are having any issues with getting everything and as much of it as you wish. I actually asked this question very recently on another webinar, and um, I'll maybe be able to compare your answers to what I learned recently. Oh, cool. wow. So there's a few very, very lucky people <laughs> listening in that are having no problems, but um, almost 60% are having problems with back order drugs. 41% of very specific drug isn't available at all. And then 66% of you are, have answered that you're being put on allocation, that you're only getting limited stock. So the majority of people are definitely, as I predicted, having a problem at the moment with uh, your drug, well, requests. So, you know, in February, if we had this talk, we would have all been closed and probably not doing very much work at all. But as the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has progressed, a lot of us are reopen, reopening or have opened. But I think what it is, is open business as the new normal. And this new normal is changing every day. And one of the things is that we want to get back to doing spays and neuters, um, as I refer to them as life-saving procedures for a lot of animals. But why are we having 
all the drug problems, the back orders that you can't get drugs that you want, that all of you clearly um, are experiencing from that poll. So we've got to think about what is it that is causing this shortage. And it's the humans that are sick with um, COVID. So if you think of that one, you know, you think about someone you hear about has COVID and they've become very sick and they're admitted to uh, intensive care unit. So this is what an intensive care unit for COVID looks like. I mean, it's, it's a crazy place to be, to work, you know, the whole thing. And in this picture, you see one um, physician working on a person and you can probably see that there's like three uh, patients here. But what we've got to think about is the magnitude of this problem. This was the hospital that was uh, built very, very quickly back in February, March. They, are, they were built in New York. They were built in the UK to deal with the number of patients they knew they would have to deal with. And then here's another converted um, hospital. This is in, in, in London, actually, where you can just see the magnitude of the preparedness. And then obviously a lot of these individual um, beds were occupied. So there was a real like, you know, response to getting ready. So this is the magnitude of the problem and it's hard to wrap your head around it. And especially listening to the numbers of um, ICU patients in the Southern states at the moment, like I'm talking to you from Florida, the number per day that are going into ICU units is, is huge. So when we look back at one single patient, this would be a classic, you know, bedside photograph of what's going on with their monitors, their ventilator, their pumps. And on average, these COVID patients will probably receive 50 different drugs during their stay in, um, in the hospital. And that includes ICU recovery um, or you know, critical care. So a lot of drugs involved. So a lot of people do end up having to go on a ventilator in the way that our human um, counterparts working in this situation, in order to get a person on a ventilator, they have to intubate them and sedate them, if not actually anesthetize them. And the drugs that they use for that are dexmedetomidine, ketamine, propofol, and midazolam. And I think a lot of people haven't realized that dexmedetomidine actually is um, got an FDA approval for use in humans, specifically for sedation in ICU units. But these other three drugs, ketamine, propofol, and midazolam, you all recognize because you probably use them yourselves. So they're needed. And then for pain and agitation, in these patients, they're using a lot of fentanyl, hydromorphone, and morphine. And a lot of you will probably be using, you know, do use hydromorphone and morphine, probably not much fentanyl used in spay and neuter or shelter world, but we use other opioids. But the other things that are required for these people for their nursing is they need um, GI protection. So things like um, famotidine is really difficult to get at the moment because they are using so much of it. A lot of these people need albuterol, um, obviously the methylprednisolone, prednisolone, hydrocortisone that we know is now effective for that, you know, really specific when they get that cytokine, like, you know, storm that they're having. So these are in high demand. And then to try and keep them cardiovascularly stable, um, they're using a lot of like norepinephrine, um, vasopressin and so on. And then on top of that, we have, um, you know, secondary infection control. So the environment, chlorhexidine, and then specific antibiotics for secondary infection. So this is why it's easy to think like, you know, 50 drugs are being used on these people for different um, reasons. And then it goes beyond that. Um, on a ventilator, uh, asleep, you need good eye care. So it has been difficult even to get um, eye lubricants lately so that their eyes and their, and their um, lips need to be looked after. And then the medics need a lot of diluents to mix up a lot of the drugs. So some of the you know, little bottles of sterile water and the small, um, the small packets of sodium chloride have been on you know, short supply, IV fluids. 
not that we haven't faced that problem before, um, but certainly IV fluids and very specific ones at the moment uh, where it's hard to get any dextrose solutions. And then of course, antibiotics are in high demand. So this I think is good that you know behind the scenes like why there's this huge demand and what it is that these people need to get them nursed through this um, terrible disease. And the MDs have come at it, you know, pretty much the way we would. <laughs> um, and I love this quote from Asaf Bitten, um, an MD, um, MPH. He, he, he basically said that living in a science experiment can be messy. And of course, when it hit and it hit so fast and so hard, that's what it felt like for all of our MD friends uh, in, you know, trying to deal with this. So just so that you know which drugs we share with humans. So these are drugs that are used in humans and in animals. And not all of them have a specific veterinary license. Um, certainly there's human ketamine and then there's veterinary labeled ketamine. But these are the drugs that are common to both of us, the veterinary profession and the medical profession. And I think dexmedetomidine is probably the biggest surprise for everybody. But these are the drugs that are in huge demand in the medical world, but we would still like to have access to them for our patients. And the analgesic drugs that are prescribed by DV DVMs, us and MDs uh, are here, and none of these has a specific uh, veterinary license. So these are human drugs that we are um, prescribing, you know, so morphine, hydromorphone, as I said, and then buprenorphine as well. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, veterinary specific products that we should try and focus on. But, you know, at the moment, the humans need these drugs. So the demand and supply became very, very much out of balance. So this is data that I collected from New York back in March 2020. So that was when, remember, New York started out as the epicenter of, of the problem in the United States. So this is the increase in demand for specific drugs in, in New York. So midazolam, the, in, the demand went up 4,000%. Like you're like, whoa, it's mind boggling. Um, and then fentanyl went up, you know, five, 533% and albuterol huge uh, requests for albuterol. So this is, you know, huge like requests. And what actually happened, what happened was that as the doctors put in their requests for drugs, the demand surged, but only about 50% of their prescriptions could be filled. So half went filled and half went unfilled. They could only get half of what they asked for. So what happens, um, you know, when they do that? So the problem was that we now live in a global society and that can be good, but it can also be detrimental. And it's certainly the um, COVID-19 pandemic has shown up, shown us where the breakdown in global supply chains can happen with a pandemic. So what has um, you know, happened is that we are having problems in you know, getting raw materials from one country to another to make the drug and then get the drug transported to where it's needed and so on. But just to have a little bit of fun and to use a, an example of what a global supply chain is and how it can be very, very unexpectedly disrupted, we have a little quiz for you. So this question, and you're all going to go, what is this to do with um, COVID-19? But you'll soon see. So this is a question about giant pandas and bamboo. So on average, how many pounds of bamboo does one adult giant panda eat each day? Do they eat 40 pounds, 80 pounds, 100 pounds, or 75 pounds? So this is your average giant panda. And remember that this is, bamboo is 99% of their diet. They're very, very dependent on it. 99% of what they eat is bamboo. But how much do they need every day? So, yep, so a lot of people, uh, it's all over the place. So the, the answer is probably between, you know, 40 and 60 pounds a day, but some of them could eat up to 80, 80 pounds. Um, but it's a lot of bamboo. So let's go and close that out. So a lot of you thought 80 pounds, that's very reasonable. 
but it is between about 40 and 60 for most of them. So what does this all mean to, with the global supply chain? So this is as an example of when things break down. So there, there are two pandas at the Calgary Zoo and they are there on loan from China and between the two of them, they require over 100 pounds of bamboo every day. And up until COVID um, happened, they were flying bamboo from China to Calgary. There was a nonstop flight from China to Calgary once a week, and the cargo was full of bamboo for the, for the pandas. But the flights were then halted with the outbreak, and so they weren't getting their bamboo coming in. So this was member in February, March, and there are very, very few places in Canada where they grow bamboo, but there was a few places on Vancouver Island. So that's what they were doing. They were scrambling to get sources of bamboo and they've been struggling um, all the time. So the plan was to send the pandas back to China and they haven't been able to do that. They can't get a health certificate. They can't get them sent back. So at the moment, they are gathering bamboo any place that they can in Canada, and it's getting shipped to Calgary Zoo. But the estimate is that they're going to completely run out of Canadian bamboo by September. And the hope is that they're going to try and get the pandas back to China. So this is the things that you don't think about in a pandemic and how the global supply chain can break down. But this is, this is has what, what's happened with... Um, bamboo being grown in China and these animals needing a lot of it and need it, that's 99% of their diet. So the one problem that we now realize is that we have a problem because less than 10% of all the drugs that we've talked about and that you use are actually made in the USA. So very, very few medical drugs are actually made in the USA. So most of the raw materials for making almost every drug that you could think of originate in China. So those are the raw chemicals. And India has a growing, um, they're starting to grow that industry, but mostly it comes from China. And then China actually usually start the process of making the drug. Then it is usually um, goes by either plane or by boat to another country where the final product is made but this is not America, it could be Europe, it could be India. And then it finally is brought to the US and then it is delivered um, to, the, to the distributors. Now for propofol, for example, from start to finish, when the supply chain is intact and everything's normal, so pre-COVID, it would take between 30 and 45 days for raw product to turn into propofol and arrive in the United States. And this is actually broken down at the moment. So we now have a shortage and hopefully that really explains to you and maybe lets you be a little bit less frustrated about why things are, are happening. So we have COVID-19 drug shortages, but we need to know what they are so we can keep on top of it. So this is an FDA website that I have bookmarked um, on my computer. If you have a smartphone, if you open up your smartphone and go to your camera and just hover over the QR sign, the black, the black and white box there, it'll take you straight to this website. But I've also put up the actual website address and I am going to get a copy of all of these note, These um, slides are going to go in a PDF and be posted on the MADI um, website. So this is a website that you can go to and search for, you know, what's the, the problem. So this morning I went to it. So today the webinar is on um, the 12th of, of August. I went to it today. And at the moment, this is a human product of ketamine. But right now ketamine is in, in shortage. And they're telling you it's unavailable, temporarily on back order, um, they're trying to, you know, they're certainly upping their manufacturing. They're predicting that there might be some later in August. And the reason for the shortage is huge increase in demand by the MDs needing this for sick patients on ventilators. So to mitigate these poten potential shortages, the D DEA and the FDA are doing a lot of things. 
So they're ramping up production. They're trying to ramp up production. But of course, the supply chain is part of the issue. But ramping up production is happening. One thing, certain drugs, and I'll take you to that website, there are certain drugs that they've looked at and they've extended the use-by dates. So we all know that, you know, in the supermarket, a bag of salad has a very limited, <laughs> very limited use-by date. And that would be correct. But we know that pasta has a use-by date on it, yet we know that a box of pasta probably can be used, you know, 10 years out of date. So what they've done is they've looked at a lot of drugs, looked at the preservative, looked at stability, and have extended the use-by dates for certain drugs. And I'll show you how you can search for, the, for those. They're trying to increase importation quotas. They're importing from drug companies in Europe that we have never imported or worked with before. So that's something that they're working very hard on. And then they're also changing some of their policies for compounding of certain drugs. So before COVID even happened, we had a, an opioid shortage and a lot of you probably suffered or continue to suffer through that. So because of the opioid crisis in the United States, which is the opioid epidemic of, you know, diversion and misuse of people, and people becoming addicted, one of the ways that was proposed to try and deal with this was to decrease actual production of specific opioids or not permit them to come into the U.S. So back in 2017, the DA um, proposed very, very, you know, significant cuts on the availability of opioids by 20 to 25 percent and the ones that they tagged were hydromorphone, morphine and fentanyl. So those actually be, started to be difficult for us to get hold of and we were often put on allocation for those. Now those quotas are temporarily being relaxed because of COVID and the need for these drugs but this is likely you know not to go away the shortage of specific so this is the extended use by date website that you can go to. And again, if you know how to use your camera, you'll use your, your uh, to hover on the QR code, the black and white box there. But you, this is also the um, website down at the bottom. And you can, if you Google for, you know, FDA drug shortages, you're going to find this website very, very easily. So what, what does it mean if you have some product in that you think, well, let's see if we are legally allowed to use it beyond its expiration date. So you specifically have to go to the FDA website and you need to look and see if the drug that you have on your shelf is one of the ones that has had, has had its um, extended date given to it. So here are just examples. So certain midazolam, um, this is a specific one, uh, the Pfizer product, you can look up the NDC number, the lot number, and if you have this one on your shelf, in theory, it, it expired July 2020, but they've automatically um, extended that to 2021. They've added a year to the expiration date because it's a very, very stable drug and unlikely to be a problem. So if you have some things that are about to run out, you can go and look on the website and see if you are okay. And if you have find your product on this website, you don't need permission. You're automatically granted permission to use this it, for another year. For example, if you have this midazolam or that lidocaine on your shelf, you're good to go. So is it going to get worse? And are we in a big problem? So the AVMA are also tracking this to try and help us. And they um, we're in communication with 32 animal drug companies that either make drugs or source active pharmaceuticals in China for the U.S. market. And of those 32, 20% um, of those companies said that they definitely are already feeling or have seen disruptions in that um, supply chain and have already experienced shortages or they're predicting shortages. And from what I can tell, looking at all the news right now, is it's getting worse again. So we have got to, you know, accept that we are looking at having to pivot because of 
what's coming down the pipeline or what's maybe not coming down the pipeline via China or from China. So the AVMA do have a website as well. This is their drug and medical supply impact website. I went on it this morning. They haven't updated it since the end of May, but they do have some good information on there. And again, the website and the QR code. But on back order, and this is probably what you're experiencing, is are a lot of antibiotics, um, alprazolam tablets, the eye preparations I was talking about be, um, because of needing lubricant and treatment for ventilator patients, and the famotidine is a big one, and that is still very difficult at the moment to get hold of. So the other thing is we as veterinarians have the luxury, I'd say, of being able to um, compound a lot of um, drugs. So a lot of you may have resorted to ordering through a compounding pharmacy, but just make sure that you are following the compounding rules, which are quite complex. So make sure that you are following the compounding rules. And of course, you can find them in great detail at the AVMA website. So, you know, easing of restrictions and then going back to doing elective surgeries and some of our, you know, we've been doing the emergency surgeries during the pandemic, but trying to get back up to speed or even going faster to try and catch up with what we weren't able to do during lockdown and not doing some of the elective procedures. You know, what is that all meant? So in the good old days, you know, whenever we wanted to, you know, order drugs, we just ordered whatever we wanted and, you know, it got shipped and that was it. It was kind of like, you know, do you remember walking down the aisle at the supermarket and you had, and they were full of, you know, different types of toilet paper and there was definitely no shortage of toilet paper. And now, um, certainly down in Florida, we still have um, some, some shortages of those things. So this is what we got used to and this is kind of what the drug issue is like. So we got used to shortages, which is, you know, there's none, so unavailable shortage, or we got used to being put on allocation, so a limit of one packet of toilet paper, you know, per family or per shopper. And this is what allocation means when, you know, Pfizer have actually specifically put um, propofol and dexmedetomidine on allocation. So you may ask for your usual amount and you're not going to get it because they are concerned that the raw product for those two drugs will be um, diverted into the human production line to make dexmedetomidine and propofol for humans. So they may have put you on allocation for that reason. So in uh, COVID-19 hospitals, when they couldn't get their prescription, when they asked for drug X for this ventilator patient, they couldn't get it. Remember, half of their, their requests weren't filled. What did they do? Well, they had to reach for an alternative. And so they would like have a meeting and say, well, what's the next best drug on the list? You know, they liked midazolam for a lot of things. Next best thing was probably diazepam, but it's not ideal. There's a lot of side effects and propylene glycol and so on. Again, they ran out of propofol. What was the next best thing? Well, they had to learn how to use ketamine, which they don't use nearly as much as we do. So the problem is that familiarity with the next best drug decreases each time you change your protocol, which they've obviously had to do. And that has increased risk to patients because once you're very unfamiliar with an anesthetic protocol or a sedation protocol, then, you know, more mistakes are made because you're not used to knowing what it looks like or how it's used and all the quirks that you learn in your daily practice. So you've already answered my question right at the very beginning, how many of you are having trouble getting drugs? And a lot of you are. And this was a survey from another um, webinar that I gave and minimum I mean, is over 40% so none of you should feel alone. And 40% are having trouble. They're trying to order from multiple distributors. They're basically shopping around. Midazolam right now is almost impossible to get. Diazepam is a little easier. Propofol, dexmedetomidine, as I said, they're now on allocation from um, Zoetis. 
And morphine, hydromorphone, fentanyl, and morphine are on allocation are very difficult to get. And ketamine, I actually had a equine veterinarian call me saying that they were having problems or being warned that they wouldn't be able to get their normal allocation of ketamine. And lidocaine and bupivacaine for local blocks, they're both in shortage. And that is a, not an increase in demand, but it's, a, it's, it's because of the raw ingredient source, which is China. So the one good thing, and the thing that I love about our profession, is that we're MacGyvers. I mean, if there was ever a, a profession that sh could be given the MacGyvering award, it would be the veterinary profession. And that means the veterinarians, the technicians, everybody that works with animals are great at MacGyvering. So that is really means to make something in an improvised or inventive way and making use of whatever is at hand. And luckily, that's what we're good at. So if we look at um, this picture, and you know we've got our technicians and nurses that are getting this dog ready for surgery. In the background, you've got you know you know the kind of thing you guys do every day, or um, seems like every day. This is actually a pyometra, not a pregnant spay, but a pyometra. So what we need to think about is like, so what what kind of drug protocol do we put together for doing us you know straightforward, you know neuter or something a little more you know sicker animal that has a pyometra. So we go back to basics and think about what are the building blocks of anesthesia. And basically, to do major surgery, so a spay, we need the animal unconscious. They, we need antinociception and analgesia. We need them nice and relaxed. And we would like them to be stable, so blood pressure and heart rate, so autonomic stability. And, you know, we always hope that they don't really remember much about anything when we do this correctly. So these are the building blocks of anesthesia. And you don't need the same drugs to produce all of these. We can you know, switch these out. So let's look at um, a couple of simple pro uh, protocols and imagine what we're going to do if certain drugs become unavailable. So a lot of you, let's just say dog castration or dog spay. A lot of you are probably going to give dexmedetomidine plus an opioid of your choice. Whatever one it might be bitorphanol because that there is a veterinary formulation and that has not been an issue at the moment. You might induce with propofol or ketamine and a benzodiazepam. And then for a spay, a lot of you for a large dog are going to put them on isoflurane or sevoflurane. And then post-op, they're going to go home or get non-steroidals at the clinic. So that is pretty simple building blocks, and that supplies you know, analgesia, unconsciousness, muscle relaxation. But talking as we have been about what might disappear, if we look at what might disappear, we've got some blank boxes, and we need to fill those with something else. So butorphanol is probably never going to go away. Um, we're going to be able to have that. And then we have veterinary options for buprenorphine that we'll talk about. The inhalant agents are not in any danger at the moment because they're not being used on ventilator patients in COVID ICU um, wards. They're not being used and there doesn't seem to be any problem. And the non-steroidals that we use are all veterinary non-steroidals and there's not an issue with those and they're excellent analgesics for what we do every day. But if we have these you know, shortages, we have some blank boxes. Then let's think about a cat that we want to use kitty magic on. So, and let's say you normally use dexmedetomidine mixed up with ketamine and butorphanol or maybe buprenorphine. Um, most of you can do a spay or a neuter certainly on that kitty magic mix. And, but there are at least two drugs there that you know, could be a problem. Dexmedetomidine and ketamine may be in short supply. So we're going to have to come up with alternatives. So the veterinary only drugs that aren't going to become a problem because there's not a huge demand for them by the doctors, the MDs treating these sick patients. So they are like, so acepromazine, uh, that's not going to be a problem. And then we have metatomidine and xylazine. Right? And they don't 
use those at all. And then we have teledamines or lazy pam, and we have alfaxalone or alfaxan, the neurosteroid anesthetic. And then propofol ketamine, yes, we use those, and there are veterinary only products available. But as I've said already, because of the demand for the humans, they may preserve or divert all the raw ingredients for those two drugs down the human pipeline to keep the MD supplied. So they're the ones that are, you know, even though they're veterinary, the actual raw ingredients might dry up for those drugs. So for, for, for analgesia, we're going to be fine with our non-steroidals. We're not going to have an issue with that as far as I've heard or can even predict. Butorphanol, we have a veterinary only butorphanol. And then buprenorphine, the human formulation that some of you may use, isn't in high demand at the moment for COVID patients. And then we have buprenorphine sustained release, which is a compounded formulation, long acting, lasts like 72 hours. A lot of you are probably using that. And that, again, is going to be you know, available. And then we have Simbadol, which is the feline only 24 hour acting buprenorphine. So we have that. So that's the one that we give it one sub Q last 24 hours, but it is for cats only. But these are all pretty safe at the moment. The other thing I would encourage you to do is to actually use more oral sedation at your spay neuter clinics, because if we have the animals more sedate, when we want to actually go ahead and do our traditional pre-meds or get monesthetized, it'll make things smoother and there may be some anesthetic sparing as well. So cats can be given gabapentin, uh, you know, when they arrive at the clinic or if they're, you know, being, um, they're going to be spay spayed or neutered before they're adopted, they can get gabapentin in the morning of surgery. Dogs can get trazodone. And then the other thing at the moment that we're um, using in some animals, as I am, is melatonin. Now, it's a high dose, but again, it's uh, an easy drug. It's pretty cheap. But if you give, and this is a huge dose, if you give like three to five milligrams per kilo of melatonin to dogs, they get pretty sleepy. So it is another uh, you know, good sedative that you could think about using. And I know some of you are working in states where gabapentin is now uh, a controlled substance um, because it's a highly diverted drug. So what I am advising you to do is to make a plan because we all thought in you know February, March, you know this pandemic would be under control, you know by by now, <laughs> and clearly it's not. And certainly in the southern states, it's escalating. And those of you in California, it's taken off there. So you know Texas, California, Florida. So what you need to do is make a plan. What alternatives are you going to order? So look at the things that we've talked about that are likely to be difficult to get and, you know, and think about what would I like to use instead and go ahead and order it. And then think about how you could conserve very specific drugs. So I'll talk about how you could conserve you know, certain products by using them for very specific cases. The other thing is you need to have training sessions with your team on the new protocols. So if you're gonna switch from protocol A because that drug, you know, you've been told you're on allocation, but you're going like crazy doing spays and neuters for the next month, you, you need to go, we gotta pivot and train our team with a new protocol. And you want to do continue education, you know, take continue education on a new drug that you've never used before. And then obviously you can consult with anesthesiologists if you're switching. And, you know, I would be one of those people very, very happy to talk to you about what to choose and how to pivot. So what the reason I want you to start thinking about it now, and I know because we're so good at MacGyvering and you are always good at this, you might have already done this. You might have already ordered some backup alternatives, but you want to do the practice run in a very controlled environment. So that's what pilots do, right? So pilots do all the training in a simulator, like all the crazy bad things that could happen. They do it in a simulator. So it's a controlled environment so they can bail out, you know, they can stop the, the experiment, the, the crazy science experiment. Um, 
but then they're trained to do what they're meant to do in real life. Now, they spend a lot of time in the simulator thinking they'll never need to use anything that they learn in the simulator. And then one day they do, right? So thank goodness, um, you know, <laughs> that Sully did spend a lot of time in the simulator because that one day where he had to land on the Hudson, he knew what to do. So this is really what I want you to do is to practice in a controlled environment with your new protocol. I am a huge believer in what is called the precautionary rule. So the precautionary rule means that you plan for the unknown, you plan for the worst scenario, pray for the best, but plan for the worst, and then you pivot and train your team for you know, what might happen with this whole pandemic and drug shortage. So what I would advise is that you have a team meeting, you discuss the drugs that you're going to order, that you're going to do a dry run, you know, with a very healthy dog and a cat with your new protocol. And everyone's going to get used to it. You're going to write your new SOPs, your drug dosies. So everyone gets used to it because then, you know, if you come in next week and yes, guess what? There absolutely is no ketamine. We have something, we have an alternative protocol and we've already done a dry run. We've tested it. We've done a dog or several dogs. We've done several cats. We're very comfortable with it and you won't be, you know, having, you know, <laughs> an adrenal squeeze, as I would say, because suddenly you didn't have a plan and there's none of your drug that you're familiar with available on the shelf. So one of the drugs I'm getting a lot of questions about is Alfaxalone. So Alfaxalone is an Australian based family owned company and they uh, were the first to market with this neurosteroid, Alfaxalone Multidose. And they also have a new one, IDX, for a lot of the um, strange critters like, you know, iguanas and koala bears and other things. So that's Alfaxalone Multidose IDX. But this is a drug that is not used in the human world at all. And the raw ingredients for it are not required in the human um, supply chain. And I have a pretty good relationship with Jurox and I asked them, they said at the moment they have not seen and they don't see any problems at the moment with their supply chain. So this is a drug that, you know, you might want to get and start using. A lot of you probably go, gosh, but it's so expensive. But remember it now is, it used to be cost prohibitive, I think. When it first came out, it had no preservative in it. And once you pop the vial open, you had to use it within six hours. Well, now it's good for 56 days once you open the vial. So in a survey that I, a group of anesthesiologists did recently, about 30% of veterinarians in the U.S. have never used this drug. And 20% have it, but don't use it very often. So they're not very familiar with it. So what I would advise if you're thinking about getting this as a backup induction agent, then what I would do is go to this really, really good website, which is the Jurox Think Anesthesia Education website. So this is their, I've got their um, website address there plus another QR code. Now they have a lot of very good anesthetic webinars. They're race approved and you get free CE. You, you just, you sign up for them, you take a couple of you know, quizzes at the end and you get um, CE approval, it's race approved. So that's another bonus as well as getting educated and it costs you nothing. So if you're going to think about moving to Alfaxalone, there's two webinars uh, there that you can um, access on demand and each of them is worth one CE credit. So it explains how to use it, what it is. It, they're excellent webinars. And just because we're talking about Jurox, the company, they actually have now brought a different um, formulation of tyletamine zolazepam into the US. It's Zolatil, it's not their product, but they're the ones that are marketing it in the US. So this is just like um, any other, like, like Telazol is exactly the same, but it's now available. And I know today is August the 12th, so order within the next three days. If you purchase nine vials, you get three free. So it's a pretty good deal because you know what this costs. It's, um, but actually their formulation is the cheapest generic tyletamine zolazepam at the moment. 
I've put the customer services number on the screen there. And the other thing is that MWI, I know, are carrying Zolotil now. And so you can talk to them about it or your supplier. But it's a really good deal. I mean, nine, buy nine, get three free if you're going to use a lot of teledamine zolazepam. And you may already do that, or it may be what you've decided you're going to pivot to in the drug shortage. So the other thing is we could use med meditomidine instead of dexmedetomidine. And those of you that have been around long enough, like myself, we used to use meditomidine in the US because we didn't have dexmedetomidine. And as soon as they came out with dexmedetomidine, they took meditomidine off the market. And so we got very comfortable with dexmedetomidine and so on. But in other countries, they, have, they still have access to meditomidine. And in the US, if you didn't know, we actually do have access to it. So with dexmedetomidine being put on allocation and maybe that supply drying up, I would highly recommend that you get some meditomidine ordered. So the, here's a list of the US distributors and we're gonna put up some resources at the end of the webinar, but um, you know, most of the major um, US distributors carry this generic meditomidine hydrochloride and it's uh, made by Modern Veterinary Therapeutics. So I would definitely get some meditomidine ordered um, sooner rather than later. It is one milligram in a mil, and if you all remember that dexmedetomidine is 0.5 milligram in a mil. So when you do your substitution, it's by volume. You can completely substitute this by volume for whatever it was you were using in your mixes, um, but was using dexmedetomidine. So for example, if dexmedetomidine isn't available, this is one of the, and you know, ketamine's not available, we could certainly use tyletamine zolazepam, but this is a, a protocol that I use sometimes in cats. So it's metatomidine with some alfaxlone. Now it's off label to use alfaxlone intramuscularly in the US, but lots of us do it and it's um, approved in other countries. So I use one to two mix um, of, of that and then 0.2 of, butorf of butorphanol per kilo. So this comes up to, um, it, it is unfortunately a fairly large volume. If we go at two milligrams per, ki per kilo of alfaxlone, we're injecting almost 0.23 mils per kilogram of CAT. Now that is the drawback with alfaxlone IM at the moment. It's a 10 milligram per mil solution, but the company knows how much a lot of us like it, IM. And so they've heard that message loud and clear and certainly they are looking at whether or not it could be made into a more concentrated formulation. But this is a, a mixture that can be used to heavily sedate uh, a, a cat that is a little difficult to handle. And this is actually us trying out that protocol. If a cat, he, he got put in the squeeze cage. Um, you can see it is like for that cat, it's almost, uh, it's what, actually a mill but we, five minutes later, we have a cat that we can work with. One of the best places to go and get some resources is Best Friends Animal Society put together a fantastic COVID-19 spay-neuter preparedness guide. So I have the entire um, you know, website address there, but again, if you wanna scan the QR code, they have a lot of information. It is a whole guide to Survive, how to survive this pandemic, but still do great work in the spay and neuter world. So one of the things that you might want to pivot to, if you haven't already pivoted to doing tyletamine zolazepam, so the you know, telazole, so to say, uh, based protocols. So this, and we're going to put this in the resources as well, is a very, very good um, review article on using tyletamine zolazepam with dexmedetomidine, butorphanol, buprenorphine for dogs and cats, for spays and for neuters. But the dexmedetomidine is what they talk about in this paper, but we can, as we said, just switch that out. So here is a switched out, you know, if you're used to using T, you know, all the different initials, we can switch out that dexmedetomidine with metatomidine. 
So this is a, a, a nice, easy formulation. What I do is I, instead of using the water uh, to dilute the teledamine zolazepam, you use metotomidine and butorphanol, and you still have five mils of the mix. So this is the instructions of how to make up this um, teledamine zolazepam metotomidine butorphanol mix. And so this is what you end up with, actually, the concentration in the mix per mil. And what I like about it so much is it's small volume. Compared to trying to use alfaxalone IM, this is really nice small volumes. So it's, a, you know, it's about 0.035 in a really feisty cat. You might go to 0.04 mils per kilo IM, and they will be um, pretty asleep. And then the other thing I think we should talk about is conserving drugs. And obviously, I mean, I do a lot of euthanasias now because I'm with lack of love, but obviously we're still doing a lot of euthanasias in shelters. And a lot of shelters do sedate animals prior to that. And, you know, one of the common ones is xylazine, ketamine, and so on. But certainly, you know, think about conserving certain, you know, drugs. Like if you are using dexmedetomidine as part of your pre-euthanasia sedation, save it for your spays and neuters or, you know, the porcupine, you know, dog that comes in that needs heavy sedation, and then switch to something that isn't going to ever be in sharp supply for pre-sedation, for a euthanasia. So oral trazodone is a very nice thing to give um, dogs prior to euthanasia, so you can do that, and that's fairly inexpensive and easy to give. But at Lap of Love, we've created a lot of different cocktails to sedate animals with. And here's one where, you know, you wouldn't have to use the ketamine, but we use a mixture of acepromazine and xylazine with butorphanol. And it's a night, we give it sub-Q or IM. So certainly that would, you know, using xylazine instead of dexmedetomidine, you know, it's A, a lot cheaper, and B, you're gonna preserve your dexmedetomidine for those patients that are not being euthanized, the ones that you really need to work on. So I put up our website, lapoflove.com resources, and we have all of our euthanasia protocols and pre-sedation um, sedation protocols in there. You just need to fill out your, your name and your practice address. And then the password is DVM support. So um, anyone watching in on this webinar, this is our behind the scenes website that we have for DVMs at Lap of Love. So think about conserving drugs and not using them for um, euthanasias. So I think we can definitely learn to adapt. I don't see any short term fix for the drug shortages because of the high demand to treat all these sick people that are going on ventilators in ICU. And we still have the issue of the supply chain from China, you know, through the different countries that has to come to us. You know, there's decrease in flights and, and all sorts of things. And there's add, it, add to it the political issues of, you know, trade wars and so on. But other countries like India are starting to, um, you know, be one of those sources of raw ingredient. There's companies in Europe starting to make a lot of these drugs that are in high demand. So I think we can learn to adapt and we have drugs that we can access that nobody in the human world needs. And if we can learn to adapt, because we are so good at MacGyvering, how hard is it? I love this picture. I had to put this picture up. So even cats can learn to adapt. Like this is, I, I don't know quite how anyone got them to do this without actually placing cardboard boxes on the pavement. But I think it just shows you like everybody can learn to adapt to a situation. So these cats, are socially distancing themselves while they wait to get a treat from this um, storekeeper. So we're going to go to question and answer. So I'm going to go back to Sarah and I'm going to unshare my uh, screen. So I think Sarah is back and I might have to put my glasses on now. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was, that was wonderful. And um, we do have a few questions. Um, the first one is asking about oral clonidine. Is there any chance that is going to be going away or becoming scarce? Oh, this is a good, is a good question. Uh, lot, not a lot of people use clonidine, but when you do and you like it, um, you probably 
want to be sure. As far as I've heard that, I mean, in humans, it's used for blood pressure control. Um, it, it's an antihypertensive. And as far as I know, it's, 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 not, it's not in high demand. And it's not in high demand at the moment because of COVID. What's, it, what's in high demand for the COVID patients is actually the opposite. They're, they're really, really struggling with pressors like epinephrine, norepinephrine, vasopressin, trying to keep their blood pressure up. So, but you couldn't, you, what you can do is go to the website, the FDA website, because it's a human drug. And if you got that noted down, if you go to the FDA, what you do is you type in the name, you click on it, and it tells you if it's in, you know, if it's back or the short supply, when the shortage is going to be remedied, but, you know, it tells you everything you need to know. But I haven't heard, and nor, not, you know, unless they decide not to make it anymore, I don't see it being in short supply. Wonderful. Our next question. I've seen alfaxalone used mostly with dexmedetomidine, but if that becomes unavailable, what is recommended to use with alfaxalone? Yeah, so dexmedetomidine, uh, like I think I emphasized in the, in the talk, so the, the volume that we can get in to a cat, and I'm usually using it in cats as an IM um, protocol, is, you know, the anesthetic dose IM is five mg per kilo. So that's half a mil per kilo. So we're not doing that. So we usually use about two mg per kilo. And what I do is I mix it with butorphanol at 0.2 mg per kilo. Now that together will get you uh, a, a cat that's workable, but it's not going to be anesthetized but it's going to be very workable. So then you could um, either use a mask or place a catheter and give it something else. But going up to the anesthetic dose, the five mix per kilo, um, right off the bat IM is, is too big a volume. But what you could do is use the two of alfaxlone plus the 0.2 of butorphanol and then anesthetize them with, with IV to top them off because they'll be very easy to work with after the IM, and then you could use an IV. So that's what? What, the other thing it is, it's a big learning curve with alfaxlone. That's why I think if, you, if you're not very, very familiar with it, you should take those two training courses from the Jurox website. The other thing that you will find, and this is the, it's a very, very nice drug with a high safety margin. We, you know, it's off label, but we use an IM in cats in protocols. The one thing that you will definitely notice is that some of the recoveries are not smooth. You might have heard some bad stories. And that, that is true, but that was also true. When we started using propofol when it first came out, and I remember when it came out, we had a lot of dogs kind of paddling and people were like, what's this? The one thing about um, Alfaxlon you have to really keep in mind is they are super noise sensitive during recovery. So in a crazy shelter with a lot of noise, you're going to see some, you know, especially cats banging themselves around. So they're very, very noise sensitive. And I would not advise using it on its own without, you know, butorphanol. Um, I've given it with ACE, you know, so you want something else on board and try and keep everybody quiet. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll, I mean, they'll, like if somebody dropped something or a cell phone went off, I mean, they just, boom, they just, they're super not, because as you go to sleep, the very last sense that you lose, if any of you have ever had an anesthetic, is your ability to hear. And as you're waking up, before your eyes even open, you can hear. And that's what we think. But they're, they're noise sensitive, and you will, um, you just need to be aware of that. Thank you. Zolotil is not reversible. Is that correct? That is correct. So, Zola, so Zolotil, it's the same as Tilazol and all the generic, it's Tiletamine, which is in the same family of drugs as Ketamine, and then it's Zolazepam, which is in the same family as Midazolam and um, Diazepam. So it's a dissociative and a benzodiazepam. Yeah, and there, there's, so there's not a reversal for Ketamine. There is a reversal for the Zolazepam, and, uh, but we don't, Zola, you know, Zolotil or, you know, the, the benzodiazepine component of it, 
um, we don't really have any experience about reversing it in particular. So you are going to have longer recoveries. If you're very used to doing, you know, kitty magic with dexmedetomidine, and then as they go to recovery, you're giving adipamazole, you're not going to have those puppies and kittens sitting up, you know, 20 minutes later wanting to eat if you have to switch to teledamine zolazepam. So you're going to, you know, have to think about longer recoveries and how do we keep them warm during that longer recovery time. But that's a really good question. It's, it's not reversible. We have started to use dexamethasone, which is a veterinary labeled product. Do you know about this yet? Is it dexamethasone or dexmed? Is it? I, I dexamethasone. Um, it is. So it's probably dexmedetomidine. Is it? Yes, dexmedetomidine. So it must be a generic. Is a generic formulation of it. So if it's if it's truly dexmedetomidine and it's a generic formulation, just make sure it's at the same concentration of what you used to use. So I would suspect it's, a, it's 0.5 milligrams in a mil. So if it is a generic that you've been able to get hold of, then that's fine. Yes, the, um, the, uh, it is a generic and veterinary labeled and readily available. It's a DECRA product. Yes, deck, so, but the, the only issue that I'm just still going to belabor is that because dexmedetomidine is in such high demand for humans, there is a danger that the raw product will be reserved only for making the human product. Mm -hmm. So that I still advise that you might want to get yourself some metatomidine because the human MDs are never going to want that. So this, that's, it's, the same, it's the same problem with propofol. We have our veterinary propofol, but if the demand for propofol stays as high as it is right now, the, ding, the worry is that the veterinary um, companies won't be allowed the raw product because they have to obviously put people first. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has been uh, a wonderful uh, presentation. You know, I, I, the whole, you know, COVID pandemic has made me very, very, or even more proud of, of veterinarians than I was before, if that's possible, about the way everybody has just stood up and taken it. And if there's any group within the veterinary profession that are MacGyvers, it's shelter vets. <laughs> yeah. So we will survive. We will. And still do excellent care. So thanks for listening in and uh, giving me the chance to talk to you. All right, everyone. Be well. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody.